I inform the Senate that at 8.30am today, 29 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the following letter has been received from Senator Hughes. Dear President, pursuant to Standing Order 75, I propose that the following matter of public importance be submitted to the Senate for discussion. The failure of the Albanese Labor government to guarantee maintaining the Australian government's critical and job-creating infrastructure investment to secure the future prosperity and sustainability for regional and rural Australia. Is the proposal supported? Six. Thank you. Seven. I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers for today's discussion. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clock accordingly. Senator Davey. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. $21 billion in federal budget funding was dedicated for regional Australia, and it is now under serious threat from Labor's budget cuts. Prior to the election, the Nationals secured this $21 billion in new funding for community facilities, health care, water infrastructure, roads and highways, education and training, securing tens of thousands of regional jobs. But now, when Labor needs to pay for its excessive promises, the first place they look is to the regions to rip money out under the guise of saying it is wasteful spending. The regions are not wasteful. But we've seen this playbook before, with Prime Minister Albanese having already developed a proven formula for cutting funding from regional Australia. The first thing they do is claim the coalition is rorting projects to favour regional communities. Well, regional funding should go to regional communities. Then they introduce Labor's own program to pay for their pre-election pork barrelling of key marginal Labor seats, while claiming new rules will be introduced. And then, when they've been in government for a year or two, they ignore the rules altogether. In fact, when he was infrastructure minister in the Rudd government, Mr Albanese cut funding to vital projects in communities in coalition-held seats, claiming the funding was nothing but pork barrelling. He then replaced the program with a Labor program called the Better Regions program, which saw 90 per cent of its regional funding spent on Labor seats. Fast forward to 2010, and a damning ANAO report found the then Infrastructure Minister Albanese had failed his own guidelines in dishing out $550 million via the Regional and Local Community Infrastructure Program. As was reported at the time, the ANAO found that projects in coalition-held seats were twice as likely to miss out on funding. Only 18 per cent of applications for funding in coalition-held seats were approved, compared to 42 per cent of applications for funding in ALP-held electorates. And in safe coalition seats, that rate was just over 10 per cent. At the time, Tom Ducevic, the national chief reporter for The Australian, wrote, Anthony Albanese has the gap-tooth charm of a shire president, a hands-on approach and a God-given talent for reading an electoral map. He went further to state, and I quote, the Auditor General's report on the 550 million strategic projects part of the Regional and Local Community Infrastructure Program released yesterday provides an overwhelming proof that Labor has lost its virginity and so has Albo in the time-honoured art of pork barrelling." But apparently when the coalition uh, makes sure regional funding goes to regional areas, we're accused of pork barrelling, but we say it's delivering. By 2012, the Auditor-General was reporting details of over 33 cases 
over a two-year period in which Labor ministers, including the now Prime Minister, had violated their own anti-pork barrelling rules. Mr Albanese, when he was Transport Minister, approved three Roads to Recovery grants in his own inner city electorate of Graindler without notifying the Finance Minister, as was required. The then Environment Minister Tony Burke failed to report an almost $500,000 landcare grant in his inner Sydney electorate of Watson. We've heard from those opposite time and time again that they are pure. Yet, as the Financial Review reported earlier this year, Labor was facing accusations of hypocrisy after making an estimated $750 million in grant promises to their marginal seats despite years of attacking the coalition for doing so. I call on this government to ensure that $21 billion in regional funding goes to the regions. Well, thank you, but there are no other speakers I can see in the room. Senator Chandler. Mr Acting Deputy President, it is such a pleasure to be standing here today talking about the failure of the Albanese Labor government to uh, invest in the critical infrastructure to ensure the future prosperity and sustainability of regional and Sorry, rural Australia. Sorry, Senator Chandler, you're not on my speakers list. Can you just let me know whose place you may have taken uh, for the timing arrangements? I'm I will, say, I will say Senator Macdonald, uh, Senator Macdonald. Uh, Mr Acting Deputy okay, President. I don't think you. it matters either way because we're all on 10 minutes. But No, we're not all on 10 minutes. Oh, but, sorry. But well, uh, I now know you are. We'll yeah. say Senator okay. Macdonald. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. Um, uh, as, as I was saying, an absolute pleasure to be standing here today talking about the failure of the Albanese Labor government to guarantee maintaining the government's critical job-creating infrastructure investment to secure the future prosperity and sustainability for regional and rural Australia. And, Mr Acting Deputy President, this is a cause that is very close to my heart, coming from the beautiful state of Tasmania, where uh, over the last decade or so we have seen great improvements uh, in the outcomes for Tasmanians uh, due to the strong work of the uh, previous federal coalition government and the prior and the uh, state Tasmanian Liberal government. And we know that over the last few months, the Albanese Labor government uh, made many promises to uh, Tasmanians as to what would be delivered during the election. Uh, and I am certainly looking forward to see whether or not those commitments are maintained, because we know, Mr Acting Deputy President, that uh, that we have many uh, election commitments that are currently under review. The government has made quite a big deal of, uh, on the one hand, spending the months in the lead up to the election uh, talking to local stakeholders, making commitments about projects that would be funded uh, in the lead up to the election, and then as soon as that was one and done for them, uh, now saying, well, all of our commitments are under review. All of our commitments will be reconsidered as part of the budget process, and I think it is only fair uh, that many, many Tasmanians and many Australians are asking the very genuine question of whether or not uh, they should, whether or not uh, the Albanese Labor government is going to uh, continue to make those commitments and is going to maintain those commitments to regional and rural Tasmania and regional and rural Australia into the future. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. Thank you, Senator Chandler. Uh, Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President, and um, I thank Senator uh, Chandler uh, for her contribution, because it enables me to follow on and remind Senator Chandler and the Chamber exactly what was the environment we entered into in the, camp, the election campaign. On one hand, we had a government led by Mr Morrison which was riven with waste, rorts and lost, op and lost opportunities. This is, what, this is what we—this was the environment that 
was led into the election campaign. And on the 21st of March, people, people responded by electing an Albanese Labor government and rejecting the rorts of the Liberal and Coalition parties. That's, that's exactly what happened. And it, it really is galling that you come in here with an MPI without, 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 any, without, any, any attempt, without any attempt to acknowledge what it was actually what was actually happening. What was actually happening in the region? In July, in July, now Senator Mackenzie, who's normally very polite and sits and and and, and abides by the standing orders and sits politely by, but has got really fired up now because she doesn't like to be reminded. She, Mr. Acting Deputy President, President, she does not like to be reminded how they shafted. Rural and regional Australia. That's exactly. That's exactly. Look, you can argue all you like, but let's. Let, I want to go back. I want to go back, not too far back, because this is a new government, a new government leading up to their very first, very first uh, Albanese uh, Labor budget in October, which I'm looking forward to immensely. Del delivering on our election commitments. But back in July of this year, on the 28th of July of this year, and Senator Mackenzie and uh, other senators in this chamber will probably know that that was the day that the Australian National Audit Office issued a scathing report into the, co the coalition's management of the 1.15 uh, billion Building Better Regions Fund. Scathing report. And I just want to take this opportunity because obviously, on presentation of this MPI, it appears the coalition have forgotten their period in government or they're trying to whitewash the history. But it's not going to wash out in the community, not out in the regions, not in, out in rural Australia, because they remember. The rorts and the waste and the lost opportunity. No strategy. No strategy for these regions. Just pork barrow, pork barrowing. And that isn't. And that is not that is that is not delivering. I just really cannot believe. I, I really cannot believe. Um, the Senator Senator Mackenzie believes that throwing in a bit of pork every three years, it makes up for not having an actual strategy for region and rural Australia. This is, this is what they're putting forward now. I mean, seriously. Now, I know they might not want to be reminded, but these are the actual facts. I know, and I know facts is not, not, they're not something that rates highly on the other side, but I'm, I'm going to actually remind uh, people of a media release that the minister, the now minister, Catherine King, put out when, 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 she, when we talked out when the ANAO report was released on the 28th of July in 2020, 2022 about the better regions, uh, building better regions fund. Now I'm going to have to take back my remarks about Senator Mackenzie being normally well behaved because she's just just proven me wrong and I just it's it's a it's a terrible terrible day so this is what actually I want to remind the coalition the chamber and of course those that are listening in to this debate over five rounds of the program 65% of infrastructure grants went to projects that were not assessed as having the most merit. Not a, 65 per cent. Former coalition ministers made decisions on the basis of choose-your-own-adventure criteria that weren't fully explained to those applying for grants. They did not keep proper records of decisions. Unheard of. I mean, seriously. 
The audit office also found that seats held by the Nationals benefited most from the decisions to ignore the merit list, which I find highly um, interesting, given, of course, it, then, well, I, well, you had a national senator that you um, loaded up his pork and went roaming around. Okay. All right. That's what happened. We're talking about we are talking about grants without merits. Those that those those that they audit, not me. Order. This is not. This is not. All right, this Senator this Brown. Not, excuse me, Senator Brown, please. I'm getting sick of saying this. Well, I'm very, very lenient. But when there's three of you who don't actually whisper, it starts becoming annoying. Can I ask that Senator Brown be heard in silence? Senator Brown. Uh, thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As I was going to remind uh, the senators this here and listening to the debate, that's not what I'm saying. That's not what the Labor Party is saying. The Audit Office found that seats held by the Nationals benefit, benefit most from the decision to ignore the merit list. It's the Audit Office that's saying this. Not, it's not me. It's not the Labor Party. It's not the government. We're, I'm here reminding you, when, as you attempt to um, this whitewash of a, a MPI that you're putting up here Today, because I do welcome the opportunity uh, to contribute to the, the debate and ensure uh, the Senate that this government is committed to developing Australia's, re Australia's regions. And, and unlike those opposite, the government is also committed to transparency and integrity when it comes to, to spending public funds. And as I've already indicated, you, you don't have to go any further than the Auditor-General's report from July 28 of this year on the Building Better Regions um, program. So, you know, my concern, of course, has always been that um, as the Nationals, and particularly in the National Party, talk around about being those that are representing the bush, that all they do is to they bring out the pork at once every three years, and they, there's no real strategy or vision for the regions or the bush, not at all. And no, no matter how often they try to um, rewrite history, it's not going to wash in this chamber because everyone knows exactly what was happening. Everyone knows. And on the 21st of May. This year, the, the, it, on the 21st of May this year, people have had enough of it. They've had enough of it. So, so we, what we do know that as we um, we we've seen that decisions um, decisions were ignored. Um, that, you know, we had the famous ministerial panel that made the final funding decisions. Obviously relied solely on those mysterious other factors when making their decisions you know it it was a disgrace it is a disgrace shoddy processes like this can only mislead our regional communities and the hard working volunteers who apply, apply for funding that is why this government uh, has has and will be reviewing all programs and commitments made by the previous government so uh, we've said that before, and um, and that is what we'll, we will be doing. Of course, all of our regional communities deserve better when it comes to infrastructure, but that infrastructure must meet local community needs and be delivered in a sustainable way. That is why all funding decisions made by this government will be transparent and will take into consideration needs of regional communities. Thank you, Senator Brown. Senator Roberts. Thank you, Mr Acting Deputy President. As a servant to the people of Queensland and Australia, I speak to Senator Hughes's matter of public importance on the need for infrastructure in rural and regional Australia. I welcome this discussion and agree that rural infrastructure is a pressing need. So I ask, what the hell did Senator Hughes's party do, do about infrastructure over the last 10 years? 
I'll save the public looking up at that. Nothing. In, the, in fact, the last 10 years have been counterproductive. Inland rail has been so poorly handled that only a few kilometres of track have been built. The Liberals and Nationals insisted on bringing inland rail into the city of Brisbane instead of the regional centre of Gladstone Port, a much more logical destination. In the process, inland rail will traverse the Condamine floodplain. In the recent rains, Milmerin would have been flooded as a result of the inland rail embankment, damming the floodplain. Recent rains have issued their warning, and the Albanese government must change the route of inland rail, sending it north to Gladstone. Recent how many major dams did the Morrison government build? None. The NBN rollout was a disaster, and many locations across rural Australia have an internet connection that can only can be described as a joke. So I agree, now is the time to get going on infrastructure. Growing our economy and putting the excess liquidity introduced during reckless COVID mismanagement to good use in building productive infrastructure is a solution to inflation. Productive capacity will restore our economy to an even keel and guarantee our economic and national security moving forward. It will increase our country's productive capacity. One Nation are committed to rebuilding this country, literally. I have already succeeded in bringing Project Iron Boomerang before the Senate Rural and Regional Affairs and Transport References Committee for a significant inquiry. Project Iron Boomerang is an exciting and visionary project that consists of a 3,300 kilometre railway and multi-purpose easement across the top end. The route does not pass through any national parks and can be privately funded, such as the interest overseas and in Australia in the project. The name comes from how the railway will be used, bringing Western Australian iron ore across to Queensland's coal, where steel parks will turn those into quality Australian steel for domestic and export markets. Trains will then return carrying Queensland coal to steel parks in Western Australia, producing more steel for export. Boomerang. The, real lane, the, real, the rail line will open up rare earth deposits that are currently stranded assets without the power to mine and the transport to bring to market. Rare earths are key ingredients in wind turbines, battery storage and most modern electronics, including phones and computers. Australia must take its place in producing these minerals using well-paid workers and not the child and slave labour currently featuring strongly in world supply chains. World steel demand is expected to increase at 2 to 3 per cent growth over the next 30 years as the emerging economies of India, Pakistan and Bangladesh replace falling demand from the USA and Europe. Project Iron Boomerang will reduce long supply chains on iron ore and coal exports with much shorter supply chains. Pro iron Boomerang will use electric gas-powered locomotives. Large ore-carrying ships burn 10,000 litres of oil per hour. For those pushing 2050 net zero economic insanity, the reduction in taking ships off the water will be significant in cutting carbon dioxide from human activity. Every tonne of steel made in Australia will take the world closer to the UN's unfounded 2050 net zero target that Labor, Greens and the Liberal Nationals slavishly adopt. And there will be a lot of steel, high quality steel. East-West line parks have, been, have received formal expressions of interest from some of the world's largest steel manufacturers to locate steel mills in the vicinity of Murrumbah in Queensland and in the Pilbara of Western Australia. Ten steel mills are anticipated producing 88,000 tonnes of high-quality steel and creating 40,000 breadwinner jobs for Australians. If that sounds optimistic, understand the world steel market is currently worth $1.3 US trillion. Australia has just 46, sorry, Australia has just 6 per cent of that. Iron Boomerang will make Australian steel cheaper than market leader China and higher quality. The attraction to labour should be clear. A huge increase in Australian steel production will save the jobs of union coal miners that the Albanese government threatens in labour sell-out to green ideology. The multi-purpose corridor I mentioned earlier will carry water from Lake Argyle and Hellsgate through the corridor, along with internet and power cables. This will allow for the provision of water, power and internet to hundreds of remote communities across the top end. Lifting up the lives of those mostly Aboriginal communities in a way that a hundred years of shallow, patronising federal government policy never has. That's the power of infrastructure, and I thank Senator Hughes for her excellent motion. Thank you, Senator, thank you, Senator Roberts. Senator McKenzie. Thank you very much, Mr Acting Deputy President. And as the Shadow Minister for Infrastructure, Transport and Regional Development and the leader of the National Party in this chamber, it gives me great pleasure 
to stand and contribute to this debate today. The fact that the only place the newly elected Labor government is looking for budget savings, the only area in the budget that they have flagged themselves, and you heard whether it's the finance minister in this chamber, whether it's the treasurer in the other chamber, whether indeed it's the minister who is tasked with the responsibility to develop regional Australia. They have all said every program, every project is having the red line run over it. And I'm very proud to have been part of a government that backed the ambition of regional Australia, that backed our industry, that didn't think the nine million of us that don't live in capital cities means that you don't get to go to a great school or that you don't get access to quality health care. Because that is actually the reality out in the regions. And that's why the programs that the Labor Party and Senator Brown was starting on the you know, rhetoric there today are wasteful. Spending money in the regions is wasteful. Spending in the money in the regions is all politically motivated for the National Party. Well, come out to Dubbo, mm -hmm. come out to Orbost, Mildura, yeah. come out to Wyala, come out to Geraldton, come out to Cloncurry, thank you, Senator Macdonald, and have a conversation with these communities who expect, as citizens who work hard and pay their taxes, why they can't get a doctor why their kids shouldn't have access to a high-quality education and why their roads are crumbling and why their economies aren't diversifying. And that is what these programs and projects have been focused on for over 10 years. And we are very, very proud to have additionally been able to secure $21 more billion in the March budget of new money into rural and regional Australia because, as our nation embarks, are on a tra trajectory to net zero by 2050, guess what? It's not going to be a win for all. Some communities are going to be more significantly impacted than others. And so the Labor Party signed us up to a more ambitious target. You won the election, tiggity-boo. Where is the commensurate commitment to fund rural and regional communities' ability to seize the opportunities that you tell us are coming? and also to overcome the challenges uh, that are coming their way. I completely reject any notion that funding a cancer centre in Dubbo is a waste, because that's what you're telling us. I completely reject that funding the La Trobe University's uh, joint venture with Goulburn Valley Health in my own home state um, in Shepparton is a waste. The only way you're going to get doctors out into country towns and regional centres is to actually train country kids in country communities because you know what? They want to practice in the country. We know it works because that's what the research over a long period of time has told us. So instead of trying to force people who don't want to be in the country out, we have focused on building facilities and partnering with local health care uh, providers to train people locally. So the very programs that the Labor Party wants to slash, the very projects that they are that Jim Chalmers right now is running his red pen through, are the very projects that will underpin not just the economic future of rural and regional Australia, but our social um, our social infrastructure. The things that should be about equity in a country as rich as Australia. It should not matter where you live in a country as wealthy as ours, uh, of your education attainment, of your health outcomes, of what your median income level is. But you know what? The sad fact is it does matter. And the real reason the Labor Party is framing this budget up that investing in rural and regional Australia means waste or that somehow it's politically motivated is so they can actually slash funding in the upcoming budget to our hospitals, our schools, our sporting fields, the facilities that you all take for granted in your capital cities are facilities that we desperately need. And the reason 
that, this, that the National Party fights so hard within successful coalition governments is because it is about need. They, all of these programs, whether it's the Building Better Regions program, the Roads to Recovery program, the Bridges Renewal program that you want to cut, are so oversubscribed. Not because rural and regional Australia uh, you know, thinks it deserves more than its fair share, it does. but because there is such a need out there. And there is a reason why you didn't win the seat of Braddon, Senator Brown. It's because Braddon knows the best way for them to secure a better future for their families into the, you know, over coming decades is to vote for Gavin Pearce, a Liberal member uh, of Braddon. No yeah. National Party there. The, the reason why people in Gippsland vote for Darren Chester why people in Calais vote for Andrew G. Why people in Gladstone vote uh, for Cole Boyce. Why they vote for the Liberal Party in Western Australian seats. Why they vote for Rowan Ramsey and Tony Passon in regional South Australia. is because they know the first thing you do when you come to power is you look to cut funding to nearly nine million Australians. Because it's an easy hit. You'll never lose a vote from it. And you come in here and you champion that you are the party for all Australians, that you are the party for working Australians. Well, you're not, because if you were, you would absolutely back not, not slashing one dollar from the regions, that you'd back their ambition and plans to grow, that they, their children deserve a prosperous and sustainable future just as much as your kids do. So we will not stop being offended by your ambition to cut the programs and projects that we have fought so hard uh, to actually have handed down in the budget. I want to also address um, some of Senator Brown's contributions uh, around the politicisation of funding to rural and regional Australia. And it, when we look back on ANAO reports, there's one that stands out for me, and it's one uh, centred on the last time the Labor Party was in government. And there was a senior infrastructure minister uh, called Anthony Albanese and his junior minister for regional development, Minister Catherine King. Oh, there's some familiar names there, isn't there? That was a scathing report. The figures Senator Brown uh, quoted, go nothing to what this team did. They redefined what a region was. It's not a country town of 20,000 people. It's not Wangaratta, Benalla. Uh, you know, it's not Cairns. It's Perth, Senator Giacconi. Your party defines Perth as a, as a regional centre and so therefore gives uh, funding programs under regional development to Perth. But what I think was more uh, scathing was that this minister ignored 80 per cent of the recommended projects from the Department of Infrastructure. So to be lectured on uh, politicisation of funding by the Labor Party, honestly, thank goodness, thank goodness, we're, thank Order goodness they have uh, got senators. the uh, independent— Senator yeah, I'm very, Hey, all money expended on projects eligible for funding. Absolutely every single one, not like Catherine King. I'm happy to send you a copy, Senator Chisholm, and, and of the report. Like the and so thankfully we do have an ICAC Senator now. Senator Mackenzie, Sorry, I just chair. remind you to make your remarks Through the to, chair. The chair, to the chair. Thank to the you. chair. To the chair. Well, thank you. It's great to see you, Chair. Um, so thank you. we are offended and dismayed by this government's decision to turn their backs on rural and regional Australia. The nine million of us that live outside of capital cities deserve your focus. We provide the ballast economically for this country, and if you believe of inequality of opportunity, then you have to believe that country kids deserve a quality education at a public school. They deserve to be able to access health care just like everybody in the city, and that means guaranteeing no cuts to rural and regional Australia in Jim Chalmers' budget.
Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator McKenzie. Call Senator Polly. Yes, Madam Acting Deputy President. Nice to see you in the chair. But let's put on the record the facts in relation to investment in regional Australia. After 10 very long years, for Senator McKenzie, through you, Madam Deputy President, coming into this chamber rewriting history. And the fact that they have denied the Australian community, particularly those living in regional uh, Australia, opportunities because of the rotting that they did while they were in government. And for the former minister herself to come into this chamber and try and rewrite history, what, what we have in the new Albanese Labor government is a Prime Minister who understands, along with every member of our House of Representatives and in this chamber, understand the importance of regional Australia and what it means to the Australian economy. And for the Prime Minister, who has been in the past a brilliant infrastructure minister, he knows the value of investing. But what we will always do, and that is making sure that all funding is accountable, will be transparent, and it will be delivered to regional Australia and the communities that need it most. It will not be delivered for the target seats that those opposite were trying to save so they could stay in government because they do not respect they do not respect the Australian taxpayer because when they were in government for the last 10 years all they ever did was ensure that they would hold their seats to keep themselves in the big white limousines. That's what they did, because if there was a real commitment from Senator McKenzie and others on that side, they would not have been rotting the system. They would not have been promising and making commitments to car parks at train stations where there was none. They wouldn't. They wouldn't have spent in excess of $50 million that they didn't need to spend in acquiring land in New South Wales in relation to the airport there. So there is going to be a stark difference between how we, as a government under Anthony Albanese, will handle and use taxpayers' money, because we don't consider it is our money, unlike the Liberal Nationals when they were in government. We um, will Senator, actually Senator deliver— Polly, sorry to interrupt you. Can you resume your seat for a moment? Thank you. So I'm, I'm loath to interrupt the debate, but there is a constant uh, calling out from the members of the opposition. It would be much more orderly and in accordance with the Senate standing orders for you to resist from calling out across the chamber. I ask you to give respect to a fellow senator uh, as she makes her points in this uh, robust democracy that we exist in. Senator Polly, you have the call. Thank you very much. As I was saying, the Albanese Labor government will always ensure that there is integrity, transparency and accountability in all funding across this country, but even more so we will invest in regional Australia because we know how important it is. It isn't, you know, it isn't going to just pass by when you have senators from that side come in and want to talk about health care for regional Australians or education when they did nothing but cut health care. We know how much they dislike Medicare. We know how critical our hospital infrastructure is into regional Australia. We also know, and I know only too well, the ambulances are ramping at every hospital around this country because of the lack of funding from the previous government. But I just want to remind people, because this is really important, coming from Tasmania, as a senator for Tasmania, we invested during the federal campaign, we made commitments to invest in jobs in regional areas. So we made what we did, we made a commitment to Northern Tasmania for Firmus Tas, great new initiative. Line Hydrogen, we invested $5 million for them to start their project up, be off because we actually care about delivering better outcomes for Northern Tasmanians. Waverley Woolen Mill, we've made a commitment so we can start manufacturing. And I'm sure my two fellow Tasmanian Liberal senators for Tasmania would support our funding to all of those businesses in Tasmania. A very old woolen mill that is now doing 
some amazing work and developing uh, future projects for themselves to ensure that they have a business model that is going to take them forward and they're getting into recycling and all sorts of wonderful things, creating real jobs in northern Tasmania. Now, we did that and I'd be very surprised if those uh, fundings aren't part of the uh, budget that will be announced in October. But there's a difference between coming into this place and defending your old policies when you had policies, because you don't have policies now, and coming in here and trying to rewrite history. Very different. Thank you, Very Senator Polly. I'll call Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting uh, Deputy President. I am so glad to add my voice to this uh, matter of importance. And I'll add to the echo that's in the chamber of, wow, he's coming from the opposite side uh, and what I've seen in my time, short time being here. Because what I saw at the last election was reveal the Australian public actually want to end this system and is currently enabling grant programs in this country that were co-opted by politicians for pork barrelling. And for many, many years it's been talked about right here in this chamber. Further, I think the Australian public got sick of a government that had a complete mismatch of policy objectives with no real outcomes. Fixing a pothole, pipeline, upgrading a building that's no longer fit for purpose might be huge media moments over there, um, senators. And you know you can cut a red ribbon, Senate, and you could talk order, about investing. Order, Senator. I would ask all senators in the chamber to show some respect, please. Senator, you have the call. Thank you. But investing in public infrastructure is vital to Australians. These investments can have real and tangible impacts for the lives of Australians. But it's also important to note that the new projects are in fact a symptom of state capture. The approach of keeping their mates in business and lining their pockets rather than maintaining and upgrading the current infrastructure has left us in this current situation, meaning our rural and regional areas are the most marginalised. Hospitals and rural... Sorry, President. Uh, look, uh, Senators, <laughs> I think in terms of we've over the, this week Doesn't alone, mean you need to heckle, well, Bridget. I've had to remind... Senator, would you mind resuming Seriously. your seat? Thank you. Senators, I have asked and I expect that each senator is going to have the opportunity to make their contribution and be heard in silence. Thank you, Senator Cox. Thank you, uh, Acting Deputy President. Um, we, we note that hospitals in rural and regional areas don't have enough funding to repair and upgrade their facilities and there's been a constant backlog of highway rep uh, repairs uh, needed and there's little or no investment to upgrade our rail network not to mention the infrastructure for the transition of electric vehicles. However, under the previous government, billions of dollars was invested into infrastructure projects related to fossil fuels. Over a billion dollars was committed to the Beedaloo along both uh, direct and indirect funding. And the indirect investments included $173.6 million for the NT gas industry road upgrade, $300 million for low emissions uh, LNG and clean hydrogen production at Darwin and carbon capture and storage infrastructure, and $1.5 billion for a new port infrastructure at the Middle Arm Harbour, which we heard about today during question time. All of this investment, while First Nations communities in the Northern Territory in particular have entire families living in one room. So rural and regional communities who need health facilities, education and roads are being taken for a ride. But once again, the major parties are propping up the fossil fuel industry in this place at the expense of everybody else. Once again, the major parties are doing the dirty work of those fossil fuel companies so they can keep raking in millions of dollars of donations. These companies don't need the money. They are making record-breaking profits and they are not paying any taxes on them. So yes, I agree, infrastructure is important and we need to invest in it. But we need investment into regional and rural Australia that is linked to and led by Australian communities that includes an independent assessment of the applications with clear and transparent criteria in their decision-making processes. This government and previous governments are continuing to support the fossil fuel industry that is destroying our planet and funneling public money through these infrastructure projects to pave the way for them to keep going and, worse still, to have those assets abandoned. We need to transition to renewable energy and we need to do it now. The good news is, is that this is already starting to happen and we are seeing the global pressure from our markets for fossil fuel 
uh, fossil fuels that is drying up. So why does the government keep spending more money in building new infrastructure for these projects, especially when the science has told us that we can't open up any more new coal and gas mines or, expand the, or extend the life of the existing ones? This continued investment is propping up a dying industry which will only benefit the executives of this com these companies while throwing workers and communities under the bus. They will continue to extract dirty fossil fuels as long as they can, long after the supply chain is gone and no longer profitable. My colleague, Senator Penny Ormond-Payne, has a bill which will establish the National Energy Transition Authority to guide Australia's shift into, in, to an economic um, powered by, sorry, an economy powered by rel reliable, secure and low-cost renewable energy. This can only be done by working with communities, workers, unions, industry and government all level, at all levels to create jobs and to open up those new export markets. The climate crisis is here and there is no doubt, but our infrastructure is no longer fit for purpose and some of it was not fit for purpose to begin with. We need to make sure that we are making the investment in the right place. Thank you, Senator Cox. Your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'd like to start with an apology to those opposite, because I'll be mentioning places in my speech today that they've never heard of. Yeah. There are places where the coalition spent many millions of dollars to deliver life-changing projects that reflect the importance of those places away from the big football stadiums, cross-river rails and eight-lane highways. Places where $3 million can build a new grandstand at the local football club and transform the entire district for generations. Madam Acting Deputy President, without viable regional communities, Australia stops. Without consistent and significant funding of roads and community infrastructure, regional Australia does it a whole lot tougher. The Coalition understands this. The National Party understands this. But for those who really need to understand it, the Labor government, they're happy for regional Australia to fend for itself. Oh, but of course, they still want all the goodies the regions produce, all that tax and royalties from mining, all that healthy trade surplus and GDP boost from agriculture. Currently, the resources sector as a whole supports over 1.1 million direct and indirect jobs within Australia, contributing over $32.6 billion in direct salaries in 2021. The government has even acknowledged that the resources sector is to thank for a $50 billion budget boost this year. The Australian oil and gas industry directly and indirectly supports over 80,000 jobs, contributed over $5.35 billion in tax in 2019-20 and recorded a $15.9 billion surplus in the trade of oil and gas. And over the past decade, the oil and gas industry paid more than $64.4 billion to the government, with contributions spanning decades totalling $161 billion since the mid-1980s. That is a lot of roads, hospitals, schools, ordinary taxpayers didn't have to fund. And let's not forget that mine workers earn about twice the national average wage, and their taxes also flow into Canberra's coffers. Agriculture is worth $71 billion a year to the Australian economy, almost exclusively generated in the regions. And both of these industries support entire towns by providing employment. And when you look at these staggering figures, it's hard to believe any government would consider cutting the artery to the beating heart of its economy. But that's what Labor is proposing. They had an election promise to scrap the Community Development Grants Program, scheme responsible for completing Charleston Dam near Forsyth in far north Queensland, which I opened this year. This dam has opened up the area to tourism at unheard of levels and provided to water security for the agricultural district. Then I can point to Tully, also in far north Queensland. And under the Community Development Program, the town received $3 million for a new grandstand at the rugby league ground. This grandstand now allows Tully to host higher standard league matches, uh, as well as tossing the golden gumboot, and allows it to host large conferences and events. Let's also not forget the $1.5 million to dredge an important waterway at Cardwell in North Queensland. This is just a snapshot of my home region, not a National Party seat either, can I mention, and similar stories of relatively small funding making a massive difference to, that can be found around the country. 
and in comparison to the money generated in regional Australia, these are truly paltry amounts, and yet they represent so much more than just numbers on a balance sheet. Now, Labor likes to describe this investment as pork barrelling, but try explaining that to a country netball club that finally got a roof over its court or a town that can now boast that its roads are fully sealed. The Prime Minister said recently, and I quote, we will fund projects, including in regional Australia, that stack up, that represent good investment for taxpayers, he said. And if you apply a return on investment standard for funding for regional areas, nothing will ever get approved under this government. A bureaucrat will say there's just not enough population to justify widening a road at Bullia or a new town hall at Kununurra, which is exactly why the coalition viewed funding arrangements through a prism of community benefits. And it's not just the mining projects facing Labor's acts. We also read that the $5 billion inland rail extension to Gladstone is likely to be axed. What an appalling signal to send regional Queenslanders who committed the cardinal sin of not voting Labor at the last election. Labor's attitude to the regions threatened to widen the divide between city and country, between the haves and have-nots. And If you live in the city, Labor will spend billions to make sure you can get to work five minutes earlier, but if you need a new hall for the CWA ladies in your, new in your small town, you better start selling raffle tickets. 8.8 .8 million people live in regional Australia, and they're not asking for special treatment. They're simply asking for a level playing field. Labor says funding for the regions is pork barrelling and waste. We say it's delivering. Delivering for the families, the men and the women, the Indigenous communities that deliver the food and fibre and the mining that feeds, clothes and enriches all of Australia. So on behalf of the Bullias, the Tullys, the Catherines, the Huendans and the Kununaras, I'm asking Labor to view funding for regional Australia as among the most important duties you can undertake. We need to keep the regions attractive to young families by providing good inter internet, safe roads, great health and aged care and excellent schools. This will have the added effect of reducing urban congestion and easing pressure on city infrastructure. Spending money in regional Australia is not a cost. It's an investment, and I would ask the government to remember this at budget time, because it is these towns, these people, who without this appropriate inf infrastructure investment in social services, in infrastructure, roads, schools, hospitals, uh, internet connectivity, without that, we will force people to be FIFO workers, to live on the coast and to fly out to these communities. And we know what the result of that is. The result is divorce. It's broken families. It's high mental health. Because in the regions, you can have a great lifestyle. You can have a fantastic community. Families can go home and play sport. They can be involved with their, with their children's lives. They can volunteer at the local race club. They can be an important part of the community where people know their names. But instead, if it was left up to these centralised governments, people would live more and more on the coast, going away from these great communities and leaving all of these important industries to be FIFO industries. That's not the Australian way to do it. We didn't grow up. We didn't raise our culture. We, didn't, uh, we don't look back on our history as being, that's a whole country of people who just appear on Monday morning and fly out on Friday night. That doesn't build the pubs and the, the community halls and the dances and the races and the um, great jobs that you can have. More responsibility at a younger age, really rewarding productive jobs. And for Indigenous communities, particularly in the north of Australia, but right across, without the investment in roads that are all weather, that mean that they're not cut off for five months of the year that means that they can access modern culture, that they can engage in genuine jobs, that they're not all forced to be rangers, that they can have other jobs. That's what we're denying people when we stop these investments in regional and rural Australia. 
And so when people call funding into regional Australia, funding that is best understood by the men and women who represent those communities, who come from those places, and who, yes, darn it, who make decisions, who make decisions, who tell the bureaucrats, great, here's a list of projects that you've approved as all being eligible, but we're going to pick this one because we know they don't have the best grant writer in all of Australia. We know that they don't have thousands of people to support these projects and sign petitions and glue themselves to the street. What we have is we have local members who go into bat for the little towns and the little communities who do the jobs, who support these communities, who give young people great lifestyles, who give us the culture that we like to celebrate when we talk about being Australian. So every time you hear Labor say pork barrelling, in your head you can say cutting us off at the knees, turning us into a nation of FIFO workers with mental health problems, with divorce and without the great lifestyles that they are being denied in rural and regional Australia. Thank you. Senator MacDonald. Thank you, Senator Cardell. Thank you, uh, Madam Deputy President. Regional infrastructure is so important. It is the projects that go into small towns and regions that get jobs, get people moving in, start rebuilding economies after the move to the cities. I spoke in my maiden speech in this place about the fact that we are hampered in regions because the cost-benefit ratios measure benefit, economic benefit, not need. When they put thousands of people saving five minutes on the way to work in a city, over dozens of people being able to be safe, drive safely down a road, it is wrong. That's right. When we sit there and we think of regional towns, the, trend, the jobs they've lost over the cutbacks and, and the displacement over some time, it is investments like these that get people coming back. When they come back, the whole town grows because we've seen the money drain from the regions. We've seen uh, deals done where suddenly farmers have to deal with wars and coals and they lose money from the farm, so they lie off a farmhand. And suddenly the, the farm isn't expensive, so the bank closes. That takes a few tellers away and takes the bank manager away, so the school's no longer viable, we lose the school. Everything we can do to put money back into these regions multiplies and makes regions better. During COVID, we saw a, a migration of people from the cities to the regions. We saw them going to where they could have a life, going where their kids could have a future, going where they could have lifestyle. And that's despite being down on the services that are normally offered in cities. Madam Deputy President, when those other across the road say, here we are, we are pork barrelling, we are funding our seats, it's not new, it's not pork barrelling. Sometimes you know things, sometimes you know people, sometimes you know projects. Senator Macdonald spoke uh, just previously about good grant writers. There is an industry in grant writing where they get commissions on getting things through even if the project is not up to standard in reality. They can make the good appear brilliant, they can make the bad appear good. And they overrun true projects funded by true local champions that will make a difference in communities. And doing that, having members that stand up and say, this is important to my people, this is important to my town, is not new. I'd like to quote from the ANAO, ANAO's report into the last Labor government. And I quote, in one instance, ministers, in brackets Albanese, made an explicit decision to approve an application that was known to be otherwise ineligible under the guidelines. I quote again, in one instance, ministers, in brackets Albanese, explicitly decided to waive the project eligibility criteria for an application they wished to fund. This is Senator, not. I will remind you to use people's correct title from the other place. In a quote, it was uh, required from Albanese. Sorry, ma'am. So these things happen. It is not new. It is not us reinventing the wheel. It is what happens when people stand up and see projects. And no, I'm not going to have a go at the now Prime Minister for this. Maybe he knew something that the grant writers didn't. Maybe he knew something that the things, because cost-benefit ratios don't know the project. If I go to, and they talk about national party seats, there was a, a program a big program, not just a little program, the big programs. If we're talking about transitioning our economy, about diversifying our economy in regions that are energy and carbon dependent, significant funds were set aside under the previous government to assist communities to do that. 
I come from the Hunter Valley. I worked at the world's largest coal port. There was an allocation of $250 million under a regional transition program to assist the port to diversify. It is gone. The future of kids in the Hunter is gone. You are taking that opportunity away from them. You are taking a chance of life, a better life, away from them. It's in a Labor seat. As long as Newcastle is there, it will vote Labor. But what do we get? We get $500 million for a high-speed rail, what are we talking about, almost a, a study, not even a project, on the basis, and I do quote the Prime Minister, to allow the people from the Hunter to get to Sydney. The people of the Hunter are not the servants' quarters of Sydney. We are not the works' quarters of Sydney. We have a right to our own life. We have a right to our own aspirations, and that is being taken away, Madam Deputy President. If you go to the website, under the, uh, sorry, in, on the 20th of April 22, Treasurer Josh Frydenberg handed down the pre-election uh, economic and fiscal outlook that included a document that was for community projects. Every one of those projects was warranted and needed. They are across all seats. Members of parliament on both sides were approached, plans and costings were delivered, discussions were had with councils and communities, and the benefits would be delivered. But every one of those projects is being reviewed. Labor say they are reviewing those measures from PFO. What will Treasurer Jim Chalmers, Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Infrastructure Minister Catherine King to do to look after our communities if they take this away? The answer is nothing. Madam Acting Deputy Speaker, on that list on their website, there are projects from every state every region, every party, and they just they all fall down. Here in Canberra, renovate, rebuild the AIS arena, 11.4 million. Is that to go? We're looking at Lindsay, Bennett Park Recreation, Space Upgrade, 0.59, pick a seat, where they're all here. Brisbane, probably not the uh, safest Liberal Party seat in the history of the world. Brothers Rugby Club Facilities Upgrade, $2.5 million. Madam Deputy Thank Speaker. you, Senator. Your time has expired. Time for debate has expired, so we will move on to the tabling.